From the beginning of Montana's distinctive yet troubled history, the treasure state was dominated, both economically and politically, by powerful outside interests who shipped in capital and bought control of the state. Historians tell us that as the Anaconda Company and its friends ran Montana, economic and political power flowed out into the hands of distant capitalists and corporations. Policy was determined in far off New York City and control of the press was rigid. Anaconda's corporate dominance in Montana's political affairs was unique in American history. For its first 75 years, Montana was a one company state. But then big winds of change roared across the treasure state. Between 1965 and 1980, Montanans ripped off their copper collar, transforming Montana from a corporate colony into a free modern state. The people finally controlled their own destiny. The pitched battle between the people and the established power structure was not easily won, but fired in a crucible of change. A new Montana was born. Join Evan Barrett and real history makers of the time as they shine a light on this remarkable era. Welcome back to In the Crucible of Change. Uh, you know, the cornerstone of a free society and a functioning democracy is that the citizens are aware of what's going on, have the ability to participate in decision makings, and the actions of their government are transparent for all. This is one of the challenges that faced us in Montana at the time of the crucible of change because of the way the situation was under the old constitution and the old statutes of Montana. So we're going to take a look at that today and see how it worked its way through from the old days through the crucible of change period and even looking at today. Uh, our guest today is a, a specially talented in, uh, in this field and experienced in this field. Uh, Mike Malloy, who is from a well-known Helena legal family, uh, a number of lawyers in the family, including his dad, who was a judge. But, but Mike was uniquely and both an, uh, uh, he was an observer of the processes that we're talking about. He was a participant of the processes as a legislator and a uh, majority leader of the legislature, and has been a practitioner in the field of public right to know uh, since he left the legislature. I, I, would have, I would venture that Mike is the premier practitioner in the state of Montana on these subject matters. Very, very important subject matters to the body politic of Montana and to the functioning of our democracy in this state. So uh, Mike, uh, welcome. Well, I was flattered by your introduction and I'm happy to be here. Yeah, no, it's great to have you here because uh, when we started looking around and saying, well, who knows what's going on in this field? You're such, so active in the field today, but you were there when the changes took place. You were, uh, as I recall, a young staff member at the Legislative Council drafting bills, and you not only got to craft some bills on this subject as a staff member there, but you were able to observe the Constitutional Convention processes, the floor action of the Constitution, hear the arguments that were made there, and then within a couple of years, you were in the legislature yourself, and suddenly you were carrying the bills. I was. Carrying the bills that implemented the fine uh, language of the Constitution. So before we dive into the, uh, what, what happened in the Constitution, probably the good thing to do is think back to and, and kind of address the issue of how far away w were we from the public's real right to know and real right to participate under the old Constitution? Well, generally, we were, we were a closed system. Mm -hmm. The legislature voted, but we didn't record their votes. The legislature conducted its sessions in secrecy, essentially, didn't provide very much notice. Um, we had a, an open meetings uh, statute, which applied to state and local governments, which was pretty good, but it had a whole number of exceptions in it that permitted uh, meetings to be closed for everything from procurement of contracts to talking about collective bargaining. And, and, uh, but, but, but other than that, we were, we were not a very uh, open system. The uh, 
some of the examples I remember of hearing in other programs uh, uh, in the Crucible series uh, was we now have, I think, I think our citizens have gotten used to the openness that we have and think it's always been that way. But if you think about what we now call an executive session of the legislature where they say, okay, you can all sit around and watch, but those of us at the table who are legislators, we're going to discuss this bill and make motions and we'll figure out what we're going to do with the bill. But you can watch, but we're going to be in executive session. We'll be the ones doing it. In those days, executive session meant, okay, out the door you go. We're going to work on this bill and you'll find out what we do about it later. Well, and, and the real decisions that were made in the legislature prior to the new constitution were made in conference committees, which were mm -hmm. members of both sides that worked out differences between the bills. That's where the law was really, really made. Those meetings were all closed. The public didn't get to go to those meetings. They were not only closed, but they were not even announced. Right. So one of the, 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 one of the uh, key elements of public's ability to participate is the public notice provisions of the law that say you've got to give adequate notice so people can be there. Yeah, if you don't know a meeting <laughs> is being held, it's closed. You know, now in, uh, I think it's fitting when we think about the thematic elements of the, uh, uh, the crucible of change that there was a power structure in Montana. Predominantly the biggest powers were the Anaconda Company and its allies. And when things are done behind closed doors, whether it be smoke-filled rooms or not full of smoke, when the decisions were made behind closed doors, the powers that be usually were fairly well represented, where average citizens were or not. not. So, I mean, that's the kind of... Now, how about on the side of the, 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 the public participation in meetings and stuff? in the executive branch and in the, in the uh, how, how did that work prior to this was it well as as you were as you were pointing out uh, today we expect to be able to have some say in the way the government operates uh, back in before the new constitution really the only way that you had any a chance of influencing a decision was through an election. And you had to hope that whoever you voted for, whether it was a county commissioner or a school board, did right by you. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, there was not a, there wasn't a tradition as there is today of letting people talk before a meeting and saying, I don't think you should do it this way and this is why. Uh, today, that's, that's sort of, the way it works, mm -hmm. uh, but back then it wasn't. So you're a, a young attorney. You've got this job. It's kind of an interesting, that's about, uh, I think I had just finished two years in executive reorganization when you were suddenly at the uh, uh, Legislative Council. Was that in 70 when you went there? Yeah, that was in 1970, uh, 1970. yeah, yeah. late in 70. So it was after you got out of law school. It was after I was admitted to the bar and my very first lawyer job. And so here you're sitting here and you're, uh, uh, all of a sudden you look up and you've got a constitutional convention going on that's dealing with issues of great interest. Uh, on, the floor of the, on the floor of the constitutional convention, the subject matter that we're talking about here got to be a little bit controversial in a rather technical way. It seemed like the bent of the convention was very strongly for openness and representation and participation and but there were some it, the constitutional convention uh, process was so different from the way the legislature enacted policy that it was like night and day and it was a much better forum for making changes than the legislature was able to do by the way it was unicameral it was, it was only one yeah, body. It was unicameral. That, in fact, they loved their, the Constitutional Convention loved its processes so much that they recommended a unicameral uh, approach. Uh, they, they did. They but, did. It, but, but it was on the ballot in a way that they could, uh, it could be, if it lost, it wouldn't lose the whole thing. They did. But when they did that, when these subjects came up on the floor, there was, this wasn't done without debate. Oh, no. 
No, but but the people that staffed the convention and the delegates themselves were not part of the old political process. So they were able to kind of think beyond the box and weren't subject to the same kinds of pressures that the legislature had traditionally been subjected to. So it was a new uh, way, it was a whole new milieu. I mean, they could do, think all kinds of new ideas and, and explore new options uh, and they did. Part of it was that they, under the rules of the, under the old constitutional language interpreted by the Supreme Court, uh, if you were an elected official at the local level or at the state level or in the legislature, you couldn't be in the Constitutional Convention. That's right. And, and th they weren't happy about that by the legislature, was No, <laughs> no, they certainly weren't. Uh, it was also pretty nonpartisan. And I think uh, one of the most significant uh, contributions to the success of the, of the writing of this 1972 Constitution was that we had women who, really, really good, smart women who were participating really for the first time in policy making in Montana. I think the prior 1971 legislative session had Two, two women, the women yeah. uh, one in the House and one in the Senate. And the Constitutional Convention delegates had I, a number of women. Do you, 19. 19 women. Yeah. 19 out of 100. Now, it's still under representation, but 19 compared to yeah, two. Yeah. Totally new you know, way of doing things. You know, yeah. uh, I think an, uh, another thing to reflect on that does has some, maybe some applicability today was the way that they got to be either nonpartisan or let's say bipartisan in the sense that the Democrats got along with the Republicans and the six independents got along as well was that they didn't sit with the aisle separating all the Democrats over here and all the Republicans over here. They sat alphabetically. They sat, sat all together. Um, the women in this in this uh, Constitutional Convention were also not given sort of second-rate status. They were treated just like everybody else. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and the reason for it is because they were effective and they were smart and they yeah. were contributing. Yeah. yeah. You could see that if you look at who was sitting there and there's women delegates, they were a pretty powerful bunch. Yeah. In fact, we've had a few of the male delegates in other programs suggest that uh, the reason the thing passed was the women were planning ahead of time all the things it took to make it pass while the guys were off here arguing about other things. That's right. I, you know, so I, I think that's that right. maybe argues for how many yeah. how much more women participation should we have in, in in a lot of things in our in our governmental processes. But yeah, well. but you do it you did have that. So you're observing this process and on the floor they they at least had to futz around a bit with the language to come up there I think there was an effort by uh, a delegate out of Billings to uh, to change some of the language uh, on was it on the right to know or yeah, was it yes uh, the the open government provision of the Constitution is now Article Two Section Nine mm -hmm. and it required all governmental meetings to be open except under limited circumstances and all records of the government open mm -hmm. except under limited circumstances. And um, this is a kind of a legal term, but that original proposal was designed to be what lawyers call self-executing. That is, you have to keep your records and your meetings open, uh, and if there was some challenge to whether or not you should be opening a meeting or closing a, a record, that that de decision was made by a court, and a court would do would look at the the meeting or the record and decide whether it should be accessible. Uh, a delegate from Billings moved uh, on the floor to amend the section to let the legislature make those decisions, and there was considerable debate about that, and the vote was was uh, was not 
uh, razor close, but it was it was there was lots of support to mm -hmm. have the legislature make those decisions. But the uh, the majority uh, decided that that should be done on a case by case by the courts because they were afraid that if the legislature started adding exceptions, that those exceptions would continue on, and pretty soon you'd have a closed system again, and they didn't mm -hmm. want that to happen. Mm -hmm. I think a case could be made that history shows that legislators as elected representatives who have to get elected the next time who are subject to the influence of lobbyists and campaign contributions and so on probably had a record of erring on the side of giving away rights that citizens had for the convenience of legislators themselves and the those that have an inside track. I yeah. mean, I think there was a history of that in Montana. Yeah, the legislature has always been much more susceptible to pressure from from large interest groups than the courts. Than the courts and this convention. Yeah. was not uh, was not uh, that friendly to lobbyists yeah. and special interests. Yeah. I know. I think we've talked to folks who said we were kind of invited. Don't be here. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's okay, but basically we don't want to get lobbied the same way the legislature yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, I think that the, the uh, in kind of a forward-looking thing that the Constitutional Convention said, we want you to report how much you're spending as lobbyists. Oh, Actually my did goodness, that. That's a, <laughs> that, that was a horrible uh, idea. So uh, now the language itself in, in Right to Know uh, it's, it's interesting, it's no person shall be deprived of the right to examine documents now, document, and to observe deliberations of public bodies or agencies of state government and subdivisions except in the case where the demand for individual privacy clearly, clearly exceeds the merits of public disclosure. Now there's two things I think were added during the processes. I think the documents were added, weren't they? Or was it the deliberations that were added? No, they were the documents were in were in the uh, statute. The initial proposal yeah. said actions and deliberations, ah. and the word actions was taken out, and <clears throat> that was one of the changes. The other change was uh, unless the demands of individual privacy exceed the merits of public disclosure, the word clearly was added, and the whole idea behind that was to create a presumption that all meetings were going to be open and all records were going to be accessible to the public and if you closed a meeting or denied somebody access to a document you had to overcome that presumption and that's the word that's why the word clearly is so significant so it's almost like a burden of proof issue yes yeah that, that, so that that was a a, a big thing uh, and the right of participation is right above that the right to know is in section 9 right of participation is section 8 the 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 it was almost a unanimous notion of this of this body, this constitutional convention, that in order to improve the system, the political system in Montana, it needed to be transparent. People needed to know what was going on. They needed to be able to watch their school boards operate. They needed to be able to watch what happened in state government. The fear was that as government got bigger, people would lose uh, any chance of influencing government. And that was a bad thing. And uh, so the right to participate provision in Article Article 8 was brand new. I don't know that it has, I don't think it has a counterpart in any other constitution. I think that's something that that uh, is, is unique to the Montana Constitution. And it, it essentially says uh, government uh, you got to let people talk about your decisions before you make them so that they can feel like they're contributing. And the whole idea was to improve the people's trust in government. Mm -hmm. If you don't trust the government, you don't, you quit voting. You don't think that they're going to do anything. But if you can do something to improve uh, people's trust in the government, that that's a huge enormous uh, f a goal to be accomplished. This Constitution was adopted when, when during during Nixon's uh, yeah. uh, time, when people when the when trust in government was probably at its low ebb, 
And these folks really wanted to change that, and they wanted to do something that would make people feel a lot better about government, and that's, that's the centerpiece. I wonder if it might be said that the support for these kind of provisions, that on the, on the liberal side of things, you might have had a philosophical bent toward it, and on the conservative side, it might have been a little bit of fear-driven about we've got to watch out if government gets too much. That's, so between that's, the two, boom. Yeah, that's a great, great uh, analogy. I don't know who, who a liberal is, but people who, who, or people who think that government can help you yeah. uh, are going to want to be able to contribute right. to helping. People on the conservative side who think government is horrible and that we should have as little government yeah, as possible need to be able to keep an eye on it. So this whole idea of transparency and participation was, uh, was attractive to both sides of the spectrum. Well, give me your reflections. Now, here you are. You know, you're from, well, you're from a family of, your dad was an attorney. Uh, uh, you're kind of used to that. But here you are. You're a brand new young attorney. You're barely getting out of the law school and doing things, and now you're watching a creation of a constitution, and you're sitting there in the gallery watching that. Now, what were your thoughts as you watched that process? Well, I don't think I, I don't think th that I really knew how significant and how important this convention was when it was initially. Uh, when at the beginning, and I had because I was I was working in my first job with legislative council. I had constitutional convention delegates who weren't they weren't supposed to be talking to me because yeah. they the convention didn't want have anything to do with the traditional structures, but they weren't getting they they somehow weren't getting some help <sighs> from some of the researchers, so they'd come down to talk to me. And I'd help them out, and all of a sudden I started thinking this is going to be kind of interesting. So I'd go upstairs and watch and in awe of all of these issues because these are all fundamental policy decisions that were being made up there, and you can't help but be impressed by how significant they, they are and how well these people, just plain old common ordinary people, most, mostly not political people, were dealing with these issues, how much they knew about them, how much they were thinking about them. It was just really impressive yeah. to me. It, it, uh, I think that there was a feeling initially when it was called together that the political insiders, the lobbyists, the people that were used to the processes before was, these guys will never get it together. This yeah. thing will fall flat. And I think they were hoping that that would think be the case. what they did in such a short period of oh, yeah. time in three months it was done. Yeah, and then they went from seventy percent having said, "Yeah, let's call this convention," to fifty percent plus only two thousand yeah. saying, "Let's pass it." Yeah. So it 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 was a process that uh, I think when people all of a sudden who were used to the way it used to be uh, were suddenly. Uh, went from, oh, this isn't going to succeed, to, oh, my God, this might succeed. Oh, well, what do we do about it? And then there was a lot of opposition. Well, but they were doing the job on the floor, like you said, that was pretty phenomenal. You, you, and a, in committee. The, the effect of a new constitution is always to move power from one group of people to another. And I think that once uh, it was done, the, the folks that wanted things the way they were, and that was generally people who liked doing things in a smaller group and, and c controlling it, money kind of influence, realized that this was going to be a big shift in power. And that's why I think the, the vote was so close. I think the... Uh, I think the, uh, the, the, the moneyed interests in Montana went after it. Went after it, and they knew that if it passed, power was going to shift, and it did. It did to the public, to the people. Now, in the right to know, there was the open meetings, uh, and there was that long list of exceptions on open meetings. But there was also open records where the issue of an open record 
the idea of it being private or public was a distinction that made a difference relative yeah. to the old constitution, the old way of doing it. The, 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 the existing law at the time the, the, the Constitutional Convention met was with respect to people's getting access to documents was that government had all kinds of documents, some of which were private, even though the government had them, and some of which were public. That's how they were defined. And the, 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 uh, that didn't make any sense. That was sort of a traditional thing that didn't make any sense to these delegates. And they thought, well, if the government has them, aren't they all public? And they decided that, uh, that they wanted to eliminate that distinction between public and private writings. And they did eliminate it. And the only exception that they permitted was if a record had to do with with a private matter, a personal, like your income tax return, th those kinds of records could be withheld. But all other government records that didn't have to do with privacy would be accessible to the public. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, in, uh, once this language was put into place by the convention and adopted, ratified by the people, there was an implementation phase in the first effort at implementation, uh, you actually got to craft some language as a legislative council attorney and and you found, what, a hundred, what was it, a, about a hundred different exceptions in the codes to the secrecy thing? Uh, oh, tell oh, us about that. We had, a, we had a, an open meetings law that had a whole number of exceptions to them. And then over the years since the since uh, the legislature has been meeting, eight, 1989, however many years that was, 1889, 1889 eight, 65 years, 65 years of legislative enactments, everybody who wanted to keep a uh, secret something that had to, to do with grain elevators or, or whatever, went to their legislator and said, will you pass a law that says this is all confidential? And so legislation said, yeah, we'll do that. So over a period of time, there were some over 100 statutes that uh, were in place making things private, about three quarters of which had nothing to do with privacy. Mm -hmm. So they were all constitutionally questionable under the new constitution because the only exception was if, if the record had something to do with individual privacy. So we had to um, draft a bill that included all of these sections that, that provided for confidential records and... Uh, kind of an omnibus openness bill. Yeah, yeah, it was, a, it was, a, it was <laughs> God, it was, had to have been 30 pages long. And we had to amend all of those sections to comply with the new provision that said you, the only exception is, is a question of privacy. And we were we the bill repealed a bunch of sections and amended other sections and uh and unfortunately it probably wasn't i'd take some responsibility it probably wasn't very well written because <laughs> it it crossed traditional boundaries that uh brought everybody from again grain elevator operators to to parents of adopted children all came in and opposed this bill and felt so badly about the sponsor who then uh, had to deal with all of these uh, all of the all of these but new opponents. We, we could name names I mean because he later was attorney general yeah, for 12 yeah, years yeah. and Mike, it was Mike Greeley's bill Mike Greeley out of Great Falls yeah. and he he took the bill on he, he took the bill on and he he tried to defend it and and then in his next election he he almost lost, as I remember, and uh, and and was primarily because of this. Right Probably the thing like the adoptions and stuff, which yeah. where people looked at it and said, "Well, wait a minute," yeah, yeah. and maybe there was even a misunderstanding. But nonetheless, it's pretty hot button stuff. Total total misunderstanding, but it was it sure brought people out of the woodwork. And in any event, uh, uh, we we did implement some changes to the open meetings law during the implementation period. It wasn't very good. It was kind of, uh, uh, it wasn't very well thought out, I didn't think. And the legislature made a bunch of changes as it went through. 
um, when I, so when I, my, my first kind of goal as a legislator in 1975 was to, to clean that bill up mm -hmm. and make it more effective. And, and, uh, and I, I did that in part, not so much because I was, you know, the champion of openness. It was because I felt responsible for <laughs> the bill because the bill failed. Yeah, for the, the bill. The first bill failed with. in seventy three, yeah. seventy four. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I would, in a previous program, we talked about how in executive reorganization, every one of the entities, it was one of those special little interest groups said, you know, this reorganization is really, really good for everybody else, but it's not really good for me. Right. That we ought to make an exception for the Barber's Board or maybe the Cosmetologist Board. Barber's thought they ought to be a department. And in a way, these 100 exceptions to the openness, every one of those people kind of said, well, this is really good stuff, but yeah. maybe not for us. Yeah, not for us. You can, have, oh, you, can, you can let everybody else's records be open, but not ours. And so that failed, but then you went about the business of trying to pass something uh, maybe a little less uh, yeah. expansive while you were in the legislature. And, and I think we generally cleaned that, uh, that implementation effort up, and I don't think the legislature hasn't, hasn't really tampered with those sections since they were adopted in 75. And because of the way that's been done, uh, the decisions for how to make it work have been court. Driven. Yeah, it, 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 the legislature could d devise some process for determining whether something was uh, open or, or closed, but the fundamental determination was going to be based on the Constitution. And the, and the, and the delegates thought that that was a better place to, to, to make these decisions. They needed to be made on a case-by-case -case basis. If you, were, uh, uh, if you wanted a record of, that might or might not be private, the, the, uh, the initial obligation was on the agency to make that balancing, but you could challenge it in court. And over the period of however many years, it's been 40 years since the Constitutional Convention, uh, the court has done an incredibly good job of balancing uh, privacy with openness and I think has, uh, has really strengthened uh, the whole idea that the convention wanted to accomplish uh, and that is to make government more accessible and transparent. And so as you went, uh, if we go back to 75 before we get out of there, you, you did three bills. You did one on records, one on meetings and one on participation, right. is that right? Right. So you kind of split it, instead of doing one great big thing, you went right. after three elements. Right. And how, how, were they pretty uh, widely accepted? Oh, you know. 75 session. One of the things that, one of the things that I just fought with, uh, generally yes, answer yeah. your question, but one of the things that we really struggled with was devising some sort of a notice provision of, 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 a, of a governmental meeting that would fit all, uh, all sizes. And that proved to be impossible. Yeah. Because what might be good notice in, in Stillwater County Commission and what might be good notice in Lewis and Clark County are totally different. What might be good notice for the legislature is just, I mean, it's just, uh, it was impossible. So we really, we, we never have really addressed that issue mm -hmm. and, until the court finally decided that, that notice should be what needs to be given to the public so that people who are interested can participate. And that's, that's generally the, the rule. Mm -hmm. People want to know, don't I get 40 hours or don't I get three days notice and mm -hmm. there isn't any such thing in the, in, the, in the code now. Now we'll get to how it works in the real world here in a second, but having, having sat through and watched the Constitutional Convention create this stuff, having participated in its implementation, and then now of course as a practitioner in the field, uh, how do you feel the Montana Constitution stands in a, say in a ranking 
uh, of constitutions and states in the United States about openness and participation in records and right to know? Well, I, at one, we're one of the few, we're, I think we're the only state that's got a right to participate mm -hmm. in the Constitution, and we're one of the few states that has a right to know, to observe meetings and access documents in the country. Mm -hmm. um, and at, at one time, I thought we were comparable. Florida is probably the, the, uh, the, um, the star, if you will, of openness. And uh, I, th I thought we were better than Florida, and, and, uh, and I still think we're in the top three or four states in terms of openness. The problem is that we have had, uh, we continue to have troubles with getting access to records when new governmental officials come in and decide, decide that they'll take another run at not giving up records, or new county mm -hmm. commissioners come in and they decide that it's a lot easier to have a closed meeting and discuss things so you don't have to embarrass yourself than it is to have it in an open session. But once they get used to it, yeah. it's, it works. Yeah, I it, mean, there's an education process a, a, every time you have a cycling in every, of new people. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and and, and I, I, that, 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 causes, that causes some problems to uh, maintaining. It's trend. usually an embarrassing learning process for people who make mistakes. Yeah. They, 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 they need, and I'll tell you, you learn pretty quickly when your fingers get burnt. Well, you learn, you get, and your fingers get burnt more often if you do it in open public than it does than, you, than if you do it in a closed session, and yeah. that's the whole idea behind it. Uh, uh, but I, I think they also get burnt when you start out saying we don't have to involve the public, and then suddenly, <laughs> yeah, you know, there's a pushback. Yeah, why didn't we? Yeah. why didn't we? We should have. We should have. Yeah heard you. We should have heard your side of this story. Now, it's an interesting thing. One of the things that happened, the legislative processes were widely open. Suddenly, uh, every committee vote is recorded. Did you, st I think you misstated, I think it used to be that everything was pretty closed. Oh. Uh, it, and once the new constitution went right. into effect, it, everything was open. You had to record every vote. You had to have you had to have open legislative sessions. All committees had needed to be open. You know, the language in the Constitution was that all the proceedings of the legislature, including committee meetings, have to be open. After all those years of saying "get out of here, we're going to do something," uh, adequate public notice of committee hearings must be given, which gets to that conference committee thing you talked about. And then there was something in there that said, on any vote which advances or changes the status or substance of a bill, re resolution or rule, the vote of every member must be recorded. So now, instead of having that one little third reading vote that didn't usually mean much because by that time everyone knew what was going on. Now there were some bills that there was a strong division on. If you had a sales tax bill, it didn't matter that they basically, in third reading, were going to vote the way they were going to vote for the, you know, and, and divided. But for so many bills, they were 98 to, in the House, they were 98 to 2 or 97 to 3. And all of a sudden, every vote counted. Second reading votes counted. The debates on second reading, every amendment was voted on. Every amendment in the committee was voted on and, and recorded. Suddenly, we have a lot of information about how our laws are made. We also have a new uh, approach to participation in that people would know in advance what time a bill was going to be heard so they yeah. could show up. They would be able to observe the, the, the session, the deliberative session when they voted and what they talked about and what they didn't talk about. And Finally, uh, they could observe the conference committee, which is where all of the real mm -hmm. important compromises were made. So you knew 
might not agree with the way they did it, but you at least know how and what they were thinking and why they did it. An interesting example of that was just last week when they had given an obviously adequate notice about the Medicaid expansion. So they scheduled it in the biggest committee room they could possibly do it. 250 people testified in favor of that bill. And I think 10 people or 12 people testified against it. Now, to show that just participation isn't the only element, it was killed. Yeah. And there was a bit of uh, but, argument about but, that issue. But, but pe people can understand sure. that. People can understand that. What they can't understand is how you can do that in secret. Right. Because I'm just, I'm just not going to, uh, I, I can respect you for having a difference of opinion as long as I know what it is. Mm -hmm. But if I don't know what it is, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't, as far as I know, you're reading astrology and making, you know, or, or using a Ouija board. And so it's really, this has really, I think, been, a, uh, 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 I think the, the convention's goals of sort of rehabilitating trust in government has been, has been successful. Now, an interesting thing happened in this sense, that you were in the legislative leadership. And as a member of the legislative leadership, uh, when you were there, there was a tradition that was kind of outside the legislative processes, which was the, what everyone thought was a private meeting of the Party. parties. Remember that unlike the Constitutional Convention, there's an aisle down the middle of the House and Senate, and on one side are mostly Democrats and the other side are mostly Republicans. Uh, and there, uh, when the Democrats met privately in what we call a caucus to just discuss strategy and stuff, and the Republicans did the like, it was kind of accepted that that was a procedure that was uh, extra public. It was outside the public arena, and it just was that way. And it was that way from 1971, when in 73 and 75, when all these changes were taking place, until maybe 15 years ago or yeah. 10 years ago? Uh, well, the, the, it was 20 years ago, Was I it think. that long? Yeah, time really flies. <laughs> <laughs> no, I but think it was. It was, uh, it was. In the 90s? Yeah. So in the 90s, the court said, well, wait a minute now. Someone raised the question and said, I think it was the press, said, yeah. shouldn't we be able to be in there? And yeah. the court said, yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, <laughs> I was I as majority leader I was uh, I was the I was the chair of the Democratic caucus and uh and so all of the things that we talked about during a caucus we thought were um best done in secret because we didn't want the Republicans to know what our strategy was and what we're going to we were going to move a bill out of a committee and but but as it turns out as i think back on it i was deceiving myself because uh within 5 minutes of <laughs> the adjournment of that caucus <laughs> the republicans knew exactly what we were and doing and vice versa and vice versa and uh and we and and i couldn't control <laughs> i couldn't control uh our are we had an extraordinary majority in that, yeah, yeah. and and so Democrats would say, "Oh well, you don't need my vote. I can go vote the other way." And so I could never. In '75, uh, you had 67 Democrats yeah, among the hundred, yeah, and they were all over the place. They were all over the place, and they voted the way they wanted to vote, the way their constituents wanted them to vote, and didn't make any difference what the rest of the Democrats thought, so it was like herding cats. We but really the, but the charade continued for 20 years. Yes. And then suddenly, only when it actually, the implementation issue you were talking about, when the courts were brought in, yeah. uh, then all of a sudden yeah. they said no. And no. now when you have a caucus, the Republicans have a guy standing in the back of the Democratic caucus taking yeah. notes, and the Democrats have somebody I, in the back I, of the Republicans. I know, and, and I think that that if you, that that they still, the legislators still think they can do better in a closed session, even though the courts have said you got to have, you got to be open. I think they all still think we could do better job in a closed session, which is the, 
the thing that we have to run into every time a new county commission is elected. Mm -hmm. They just think for some reason they have this mindset that they can get more government accomplished without having the public involved. And that's a, that, that may be true, but we're in a democracy and, and we're in a, we're, we're, we give you your power because we trust you. And if we, if we do it, if you do it in secret, we're not going to trust you. And it's, uh, and it's, uh, it, it doesn't work. Well, you know, the, 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 the nature of the beast in government is that uh, if you look at phil philosophically, but also in practicality is if you want to be efficient, you can have a dictatorship. Yeah. That's Efficiency much. is not the hallmark of democracy. No. no. Not properly done. No. No. And, uh, and again, I think uh, this, this, both the Constitutional Convention and their changes and the court's willingness to further their purposes has been just a tremendous uh, influence on, on good government in Montana. Mm -hmm. Now, you're what I say is the premier, but you're at least one of the major practitioners in the area of right to know. I think you operate what's called the right to know or the freedom of information hotline, right. which that is something that both the press is concerned and uses, but average citizens do yes. too. Tell us a yes. little bit I, about that. I get, I answer legal questions from anybody who wants to ask, essentially, and there's a website and most people go on the website and they either get my email or phone number or communicate through this website and they ask questions about can uh, can this uh, county commission refuse to let me have a say in this decision? Can I get this document? I, I've been asking for this document, and they, it's a budget document, and I, they won't give it to me. So they ask these questions, and I say, no, you, you're entitled to that document. The public, the, there's no privacy interest in a budget document, so you're entitled to it. They're just not wanting to let you see it. So you really have to, you can tell them I told you that, that it's open or I, I'll write a letter sometime and, and say this has got to be open. And most of the time, most of the time, I'd say 95% of the time, begrudgingly the governmental aid entity will say, okay, you're right, we'll give it to you or we'll keep it open or whatever. Because I think people really understand the importance of, of, of this idea of transparency, both Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives. It's really important, and I think they don't like it very much sometimes, but they finally agree to do it. But oftentimes they won't, and, and so you have, to, you have to bring a lawsuit, because that's the only way of addressing an issue under this constitutional provision. And, uh, and again, the courts have been really, really good about enforcing the right to know. Mm -hmm. So, when I'm reading the paper, I often say, read, oh, there's a, something going on down in Billings, and there's a big fight over some kind of records or this or that, and uh, some county commission or somebody is saying, hey, you can't see it, and there's a lawsuit, and I read your name. And so you're the litigator on behalf of it. But it seems that there might be an issue that if one... If, if the, if the self-execution, meaning uh, it stands on its own, but it might be decided by a court, if, it require, if you get a, a reluctant governmental entity uh, or one that just says, I, we don't think it's that clear, let's, let's figure this out. If you're an average citizen and you have to bring a lawsuit, you've got to engage an attorney. That's a bit of an impediment for an average citizen, isn't it? It's a huge impediment, and even though in the bill that I sponsored in 1975, we added a statute that permitted people to recover their attorney's fees. It's still uh, hard for people, well, it's hard for an attorney to sort of take the case on with the understanding that if they win, they get their fees, but if they don't win, they don't get anything. Uh, uh, or they make a deal with the client, you pay me fifteen thousand dollars and I will get you into this meeting <laughs> or I will get you this record and that seems to be not worth the, the to an individual citizen that's not worth the fight 
And, uh, and so even though we do have this fee shifting provision, it's still really hard for people to think about. People don't like to litigate generally. Mm -hmm. and, and to suggest that they have to get a lawyer and file suit is just really chilling, I found. But there are people and there are, and there are media entities that are willing to do it for the sole reason of making sure that governments are, are held accountable. And because if they don't, then this, this good constitutional provision and these good statutes don't mean a hill of beans. Mm -hmm. So we've evolved as a state now. And like I said, most people assume the openness now. 40 years of this, and people think this is the way it's always been, and it hasn't always been. But part of our series is addressing the issue of, uh, you know, how do we keep from sliding back, and are there new things to be grappled with? And it seems like the new secrecy is not wrapped up in the governmental committees and processes in the legislature. It's wrapped up in the process of getting people into there. That is the lack of transparency on how money is spent to elect people to office. That's well, kind of today's quandary. That's, that is a huge issue and it exists in part because the convention changes, shifted power from a small group of very wealthy people to the people, to the, to mm -hmm. the, to the public. And, uh, and with the U.S. Supreme Court decision in the Citizens United case, we've sort of, we've sort of reactivated uh, the ability of very wealthy people now who uh, have to... Under freedom of speech. Yeah, under freedom. They have to, they have to, uh, the only way they can influence the way government operates, they used to be able to do it by throwing money over the transom. Uh, but what they do, what they have to do today is, is use their money to control, to uh, control elections. And uh, with Citizens United, we, there is a vehicle for controlling elections, for spending huge sums of money to control elections, and the people don't know who's doing it. And that has to be addressed somehow, and I'm, I'm, either it has to be addressed by a change in the Supreme Court decision or, or a constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. Now, the Supreme Court said that there is the ability to do some regulation within this just like with free speech, when Oliver Wendell Holmes says you can't yell fire in a crowded theater, there's some regulation of free speech. There's some ability to regulate this if the states want to do it. And uh, now uh, our Corrupt Practices Act was thrown out by the feds and said it, under federal law it doesn't work. But they've still said Congress can do this and the state of Montana potentially could try to do it, could they not? by saying we need some transparency and openness if we're willing to do that? Yes, but every time the legislature uh, requires more accountability of people who participate in elections, uh, every time that happens, uh, there is a challenge raised under the First Amendment. And federally. If federally, federal court, yeah. federally, but I I I I don't know I don't know how to predict the outcome of this uh, of this uh, dilemma. Montana could require more disclosure, could require much better disclosure, but the the. Uh, uh, people that are participating in decisions still today are doing it anonymously. And we still don't know who's participating in legislative elections, for example. We do have some statutes in Montana that are currently in place uh, that uh, through the campaign commissioner uh, uh, require uh, lack of, they don't allow coordination so if you want to have free speech, you can't be in collusion with the candidate. And yet there's been a lot of, apparently, some violations of that, which 
are, are being heard in the courts almost as we uh, sit here and speak that after this legislative session there'll be some hearings that may result in uh, some legislators being told you can no longer be a legislator if, they're, if you're found guilty and there have been at least two settlements by legislators who said okay I'm guilty I'm, I'm going to do a settlement yeah, but it isn't. They didn't say guilty, though, did they? They said, I'm, uh, uh, it might have happened. It might have happened. Maybe. I won't <laughs> contest it. I, I, well, the pro but the problem is that, that uh, money still talks in, in elections. And under the First Amendment, according to the U.S. To the US Supreme Court, people can contribute uh, unlimited. unlimited amounts of money to a uh, to a campaign that is not connected with the candidate, but has incredible influence on whether or not that person is elected, and it's that contribution that that participation that we really don't know too much about, and that's got to change. So we've gone from a, a, a old constitution and old statutes that had closed systems, lack of public involvement, lack of public awareness, lack of transparency, and we went through a whole process of fixing up Montana. Right. And then from on high, we have a new problem. Right. And, and it, it's coming f full circle because the problem that, that, that we thought uh, uh, great fights over before the new constitution was with people that had a lot of money and could therefore influence the way policy was made in Montana. We went through this process, we got it, we shifted the power so that people are now in charge of making decisions and not big companies. And with Citizens United, we're headed back in that direction again, where influence can come from big money in even states as small as Montana, and we don't really know who's doing it. So the challenge of keeping us from sliding back is interesting because it's now a, uh, it's not just an uh, intra-Montana issue, it's a, it's a national federalism issue in a way. We're having to grapple with federal statute and federal rights. And it's it, but it's true, that, but the same uh, issue is true nationwide. Uh, the influence of dark money is 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 uh, prevalent throughout the country, and and it's not good. It, it, you know, it's like these folks held this hearing on on uh, um, extending Medicaid, mm -hmm. and all these people came, and the legislature still voted against it. Well, that's that's the reason, way the pro probably. yeah that that's the way the process works. Um, and I'm guessing that if, if people knew who was financing somebody's uh, independent expenditure campaign, that, uh, that it probably would have an impact on whether you'd believe it. Yeah. But, uh, but, but at least if it's open and people know about it, they... Voters they can make, can make yes, knowing, knowledgeable right. decisions and so right. on. Yeah. Well, we've had a very fast hour. Yes. And we're there already, and it's been a marvelous uh, exposure of information about what we've done as a state to become transparent and open. Uh, we've been blessed to be able to have you to be able to be here as, as I said, as an observer, as a participant, and now as a practitioner. And we've looked at openness and participation in Montana government. It's been a marvelous one hour. We appreciate it. We'll look forward to seeing you again soon on In the Crucible of Change.